Hello and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 6th of December and this month's non-farm payrolls uh, webinar for November. Before we get started, just do a quick risk warning, uh, do a little bit of housekeeping and what have you. Um, and look ahead to, look ahead not only to today's jobs report, which I think it's obviously going to be important in terms of the overall direction of the dollar, but I think in terms of where markets go and what the Federal Reserve does next week, it's probably not going to be too market, it's not going to have a big market impact. Um, I think the expectations around the jobs report, they're going to have to be very, very bad in terms of, or a big miss in terms of the actual headline numbers for it to really drive um, any change in US monetary policy. Um, we do have a Federal Reserve rate meeting next week. At the moment, the market is pricing a 0% probability that the Fed will cut rates next week. In fact, I think when you actually look ahead towards the Federal Reserve meeting next week, what we've seen over the past few days has been US economic data that has been pretty ambiguous in terms of the state of the US economy. Um, I think more than anything, what's driving um, the markets at the moment as we head into year end, and I think we do have to bear that in mind, we are, do, we are coming towards the end of the year. There's probably only really two full trading weeks left now uh, until... Um, January because if we take next week obviously next week is a very very big week in terms of macro risk not only do we have a Fed meeting but we also have a small matter of the UK general election um, European Central Bank rate meeting as well we also have um, China trade numbers for November and one of the big drivers this week obviously has been um, the rather ambiguous statements coming out from President Trump. The change of tone that we saw at the NATO summit when he held open the possibility that there wouldn't be any trade deal between the US and China um, much before the presidential election on the 3rd of November 2020, which I think threw a little bit of a fly in the ointment as you can see from this correction that we saw on Monday and then Tuesday. That being said, whether we get a trade deal or not, I think is neither, well, I'm not going to say it's neither here nor there. Um, we're not really going to know what the state of play is until the 15th of December, when the US decides whether or not to impose those tariffs um, on Chinese goods, $156 billion of Chinese goods, the remaining $156 billion of Chinese goods. So in that context, today's payrolls report, while important in terms of the direction of the dollar, I don't think it's going to really influence much where stock markets go in the longer term. So let's look at what we are expecting to see and hear from the numbers when they come out in 15 minutes time. Now you may recall um, last month um, expectations around the payrolls report were a little bit low, shall we say. Um, there was an expectation because of the General Motors strike that the numbers, the headline number would come in around about 1995k. In the event, we got a reading of 128k, um, which was a little bit, I suppose, of a mixed blessing because what it did was it essentially told us that despite the, despite the General Motors strike, um, the US labour market still remains um, fairly robust. Um, but then again, we look at the ADP payrolls report on Wednesday, which came in at a very weak number of around about 67,000. And then you sort of wonder, well, actually, is it as healthy as we think it is? And then, of course, you have weekly jobless claims, which come in at a seven month low. Um, generally, the November jobs report tends to be fairly decent because of seasonal hiring trends, seasonal hiring patterns. So expectations for today's payrolls report are for a number in and around 180,000 jobs. I think more importantly, 
will be is what sort of revision we get to the October number as well. Um, because I think while we we're expecting a better number for November, obviously the um, the General Motors jobs will get added back into the number, so that will artificially inflate it in the same way that um, it artificially held down the October jobs report. But when you actually look at the two ISM reports out earlier this week, the manufacturing number pasted a very weak picture of the US economy in terms of manufacturing. But then when you look at the services side of it, while the headline number was slightly weaker at 53.9, all the key internal indicators were actually stronger than expected. So new orders increased to 57.1, the employment component rose to 55.5, and prices paid rose to 58.5, all above the October reading. So given that services is a much greater proportion of um, the US economy, um, we should we should find that um, overall the US economy is still looking in fairly decent shape. Now I do understand, I think some people are saying they can't get any audio. It might be worth just checking your sound settings on the PC, check the speaker levels and what have you, um, to see whether or not that's the part of your problem. Um, I've had I've got a load of people telling me that they can hear me, so I'm guessing it's not a technology problem my end. It's more likely to be a technical problem the other end. So could you just please confirm, um, ladies and gentlemen, that you can hear me, um, those of you who are logged in, um, just to be sure that it's not a technical problem my side. I'm seeing that my microphone is working properly. I can hear the audio. I can see the bars moving up and down on my screen, which suggests that the audio is working and uh, I haven't muted myself by mistake. Uh, I know some people would like to say that it wouldn't be a bad thing for me to mute myself by mistake, but I'm sure at the moment uh, you guys aren't um, in that category. So anyway, moving seamlessly back to the seminar. Um, are we likely to get a, a correction as a result of the ambiguity that we're seeing about trade? And will a poor payrolls report undermine the narrative for the move higher that we've been seeing in markets over the course of the past few weeks? I, for one, don't believe in trying to pick the top or trying to pick the bottom. I just basically trade what's in front of me. So at the moment, what I'm seeing is we are very much in an upward trend, despite the fact that we have come off the back of three successive daily, daily declines. But more importantly than that, what we have seen is that we have managed to rebound quite nicely. And I think that more than anything is important. Let me just pull all of these things over here. Actually, I'll just get rid of the unemployment rate because I don't think there's enough room for that. And I'll just bring up the average earnings numbers. So the key numbers for me are as follows, because it's not just the US employment report, it's also the Canadian jobs report. And obviously that will that will um, really push dollar CAD around. And dollar CAD has been trading um, in a quite choppy fashion because of obviously what's happening in the oil markets. But let's let's start obviously with the Let's start, and I've got to stop saying obviously, let's start with the S&P 500. So 50 day moving average, we're above that. The trend still is upward. If we look at a weekly chart, and we do have to understand that the week's not over yet, so the candle hasn't closed, but this long shadow here suggests to me that there's plenty of buying interest at lower levels. We can see it in these candles here and here. If that pattern's repeated, it would suggest to me that at the moment, for the moment, that there's there's no appetite really to um, sell out of long positions as we come into year end. Normally what happens is that if there's an appetite, the move to the downside follows through. These long shadows suggest to me, particularly over the course of the past few weeks, that there's plenty of demand to buy on dips. And that continues to be the case based on the charts that I'm currently looking at. So if we look at the S&P, um, decent support around about 3,100. If we look at the Germany 30 or the DAX, as it's known 
to you, better known to you and you and I. Again, 50-day moving average is looking to support any thrusts to the downside. On the upside, it does does appear to be finding a little bit of a cap in and around 13,200. So 13,200 is likely to be a key level. Um, certainly does to be a little bit of failing momentum on the DAX, um, unlike the S&P, which still looks fairly well supported. But crucially, it's still above the 50-day moving average. So I think while it's above the 50-day moving average, it's very much by the dips. And it's the same. And I think the same thing applies to the Nikkei 225. I think it's important that when you're looking at equity markets, you not you don't just look at one. You look at them in the round. And in the round, um, what they what these markets are telling me is that we are still in an upward trend. Yes, we're consolidating a little bit. Certainly, that's borne out in the DAX, and we're also seeing it borne out in the Nikkei as well. So, um, in terms of in terms of where do we go to next? I think at the moment, despite the fact that we did see a little bit of a push to the downside this week, there still there still remains fairly decent demand, barring any interventions from President Trump. And I, I, I don't think it's I don't think it was a surprise that after saying that he didn't think that he was quite relaxed about a trade deal with China after the next presidential election, it was no surprise after two days of equity markets falling quite sharply that he came out and said, well, actually, trade talks are going quite nicely. Thank you very much. And suddenly the markets go back up again. So it's this ambiguity that's causing the choppiness and it's likely to continue to do so. So what about the dollar index? I've just been asked. Well, again, we've seen a bit of a sell off in the dollar index over the course of the past few days. Crucially, however, it is still above that key support level that I identified a month ago, around about 97.10, 97.20. And until such times, and we can see from this chart here, it's still very much in an uptrend. So again, it's a case of very much buy the dips in the US dollar. And that would suggest to me that the upside in euro dollar is likely to be fairly limited. So if we look at the upside in euro dollar, we can see straight away from this chart here that even if we get a good dollar number, it's it's likely to, even sorry if we get a bad dollar number, it's unlikely to drive euro dollar much higher than it is now. We can see this 111 area here, 111 10 15. Even if we move above this red line here, and I'm going to zoom it in for you, we've also got the 200 day moving average, which comes in around about 111.55, and then we've got the downtrend line from those highs that we've drawn in all the way back in 2018. So euro dollar is still very much, I think, a case of sell the rally when it comes to looking at that particular currency pair. And let's not forget, we also have the ECB rate meeting on the Thursday of the general election. Just being asked how I get the data boxes on the um, non farms. Basically, you go to this drop down here where it says news and analysis, go to market calendar, select that, and then on the right hand side there will be a checkbox whereby you select the option there and it, it comes as a little bell. And what will happen is that when you select those items, there will be a 10 minute warning. Um, for the particular data item that you check that that, that 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 particular item is due to come out. So hopefully that answers your question. Go to news and analysis drop down, select market calendar and then select the alert box um, for the data point that you want to send an alert for. And then that just pops up 10 minutes before the numbers are due out as a reminder to you that there's data coming out. So hopefully that answers your question. So what let's have a quick look at dollar CAD because obviously we've got the um, Canadian payrolls report as well coming up and what we saw in October was a slightly disappointing number from uh, the Canadian jobs market that does tend to be a very flaky number it does tend to fluctuate quite a lot expectations for that are for um, 
gains of 10,000 new jobs against a loss in October of minus 1.8. Non-farms you can see here 180, 128 and obviously the jobs numbers, not the jobs numbers, the wages numbers which um, as, I think as long as they're around about 3%, we did see a big drop last month um, from around about 3.2, 3 3.3 to 3%. And I think that did prompt a little bit of dollar weakness. But overall, um, ov overall, it, I don't think it changes the overall picture um, with respect to um, US central bank monetary policy. Um, we are not going to get another rate cut this year. And it's highly unlikely that we'll probably get one much before March next year. Markets aren't priced for it at the moment. Bond markets aren't priced for it. And the gold market is not priced for it. What we've got at the moment is dollar CAD is vulnerable to further weakness, further Canada strength, further dollar weakness, back down towards this line here. We've been trading sideways for pretty much the last um, six months. And I don't think that's likely to change. To this 50-day moving average could act as a little bit of resistance, so we could get a rebound back to 132. But overall, I think the direction of travel for dollar CAD is for slightly weaker US dollar, a slightly stronger Canadian dollar. Going to look at cable very, very briefly, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, a little bit more about that in the UK election over the course um, after the payrolls numbers. But I think I think there's potential for further sterling upside. And it's not because of US dollar weakness. Um, it, I think that will be largely as a result of sterling strength. And I'll, and, I'll, and I'll articulate why that is after the payrolls numbers have come out. But overall, I think if we get a little bit of sterling weakness, we're likely to find um, buyers around about 130, 70, 130, 80. Um, certainly looking for a move higher on the pound against the dollar. Dolly yen very briefly. Um, before the numbers come out in around about 35 seconds. In a range, decent support around about 108.40. Um, it's also where the 50-day moving average is here. Um, I think if we get a weak number on the payrolls numbers, the downside is likely to be fairly limited unless it misses by quite a substantial amount. So if you're talking sub 100,000, you might get a sharp dollar sell-off. And certainly the markets do appear to be starting to price that in you're getting a little bit of dollar selling but let me just put that on a five minute chart and then await the numbers and here we go okay that's a really bad Canadian jobs number minus 71.2 um, overall the non-farm payrolls numbers 266 I mean that is just an absolutely stonking number and an upward revision to 156. They've revised upwards the wages numbers. Well, you can see for yourself what that's doing. Pushing euro dollar down, pushing dollar yen up, pushing cable down. And 3.5% the unemployment rate. I mean, that is not just a Goldilocks report. That is a gangbusters report for the US, the US non-farm payrolls. So I don't know about no, uh, no rate cut. In December, I don't think we're going to get a rate cut at all. I mean, I know I was talking about seasonal hiring boosting the November numbers, but I mean, that's just boosting the numbers on steroids. 266,000, 128 to 156 on the revision higher. Really disappointing Canadian number, and that's that's going to send dollar CAD higher, Canadian dollar lower, US dollar higher. Um, the big level on dollar yen on any move to the upside is going to be once the chart loads let me just quickly reset that and zoom in just zooming in now it's going to be around about 109.20 109.30 if we get that high there we go so we're talking about the highs of yesterday around about 109, but 109.20, 109.30, that's, that's the key level. Let's just get rid of those flash numbers there and there and move swiftly on. So 
higher stock markets on the back of that, not surprisingly. Uh, stronger dollar. More importantly, gold prices are likely to continue to fall the way that they have been over the course of the past few months. The direction, and tra the direction of travel um, on that is quite clear from this daily chart here. Um, I'm talking about selling the rally on gold prices at the moment and that's pretty much borne out by this chart here. Linking the highs from September, looking at the lows, we're making progressively lower highs and lower lows. So at the moment there's no real upward, upward momentum in terms of gold prices and the next key support level on gold is around about 1450. I think there's potential in gold for us to come back to around about 1420, 1410. But um, certainly I think we can expect to get a, a tweet from POTUS, President of the United States, saying that the US economy is on fire. And uh, I'm just timing that now, 321, and I'm sure we will get one. Um, because even though the Don watches the stock market, you can be sure that this won't have escaped his attention. So I was talking about the dollar earlier and the fact that uh, we were near support and it was still in an uptrend. Well, I think that pretty much confirms it. And I also think it confirms the fact that maybe the October rate cut was a little bit premature. Um, certainly a number of Fed policy makers have been articulating that. And when we look at next week's Fed meeting and Ladies and gentlemen, next week's Fed meeting is important in the context of where the Fed is likely to see the US economy as we head into the year end, but more importantly in terms of the direction of monetary policy, because next, <coughs> next month the Fed voting members change. And when the Fed voting members change, sometimes the, the steering of the dot plots changes as well as different members start to be start to wield a vote who didn't have a vote this year so when we when we when we when we're monitoring the fed next week it's very important to hear first and foremost what jay powell has to say and more importantly what the statement says and i think there's nothing in that statement that is going to be compelling the Fed to cut rates anytime soon, irrespective of what President Trump says. He wants lower rates. From that jobs report, the US economy doesn't need lower rates. So um, 14.45 is good support. I've just been um, asked by one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the listeners. Yes, it is good support. It's the previous low through here, and that's that's what I'm targeting initially. So you will get a move to 14.45. We've got a nice low there. We've got a nice low there. But all I'm saying is that subsequent rebounds at the moment have been getting lower and lower. If we look at this one here, there's a lower high to there. That's a lower high. That's a lower high. That's a lower high. So we're now below the 50-day moving average. So taking that to its obvious conclusion... If we break below 1445, 1450, my, my support is 1450. If we break significantly below 1450, then the next target is this series of lows down here between 1410 and 1400. So I'm not calling for 1410 yet, but what I'm saying is that unless gold is able to push back above the 50 day moving average, then by the laws of momentum then 1450 could well break and head down to 1410 1420 so um, you're not wrong by saying 1440 45 is good support it is but unless we get a break above the 50 day moving average that will give way to a move down towards 1410 1420 so hopefully that clarifies my thought processes I'm sorry if that wasn't clear um, key, I'm being asked about Kiwi Dollar. More than happy to talk to you about that. Um, 
that has broken above the 200 day moving average that in itself is not that significant because it did that here as well so i think for the moment kiwi dollar is probably going to find a little bit of resistance around about 66 why because it all it found support in and around this area back in july so where we are now is likely to be a fairly decent area to potentially get short of kiwi dollar and Generally, Kiwi and the Aussie tend to move pretty much in lockstep with each other. And I think it would be highly unusual if Kiwi broke away to the upside and the Aussie dollar didn't. So the Aussie dollar at the moment still remains very much in a downtrend. And for that, basically for clues to Kiwi, keep an eye on the Aussie. Yes, I know Aussie Kiwi is a fairly decent cross. I used to work for Commonwealth Bank of Australia. So I know all about Aussie Kiwi and how that that currency pair moves. But if we look at the Aussie dollar, we are very much in a downtrend, very much so. We can draw in the line that we've got from these highs back in December last year and also the 200 day moving average. And at the moment, while we have hit what I would call an interim bottom around about 66.85, what we haven't been able to do is break above this downtrend line from those those from those highs that we saw in December last year and until we do so and until we break above the 200 day moving average the Aussie hasn't done that then I think the Kiwi upside is likely to be fairly limited because generally they do tend to have similar um, dynamics when it comes to moving higher or lower so that's the Aussie dollar I'm going to get on to cable in a minute I'm just being asked about crude oil um, for me, that's very much in a range. It's 55.65 on the wide of it. So I would be selling oil anywhere near the top end of the range, around about $65 a barrel. We've also got the 200-day moving average. I'm guessing you mean, oh, not, I, you just said our WTI. I'm talking about Brent, so I'll come to WTI in a minute. Brent, we've also got the 200-day moving average, this series of highs through here. Um, so I would suggest that as long as we stay below this series of peaks here, the 200 day moving average, very much in a range. We're probably going to come back down to these lows around about 61, 60, 61 dollars a barrel. As for WTI, that's here. Just wait for it to load. Let's get rid of that line because that's superfluous to requirements. So just click on that and delete. Um, very much in an uptrend, but at, towards the top end of its recent range. Certainly wouldn't be long at these levels. I'll probably potentially be looking for a little bit of a move lower. Um, this candlestick here is quite instructive. Very long upper shadow. Just tried to move higher. Failed. Call it a doji star. Uh, and as such, the likelihood is we're probably going to drift back down towards these levels here. And let's not forget that even though... Um, this is the last three days we are towards the top end of this week's range and even though we haven't reversed the declines of last week we almost have so I don't think there's much more upward momentum in WTI the OPEC meet I've been asked about the OPEC meeting you know to be quite honest they're an exercise in jawboning um, they haven't really agreed anything and the move higher over the course of the past few days was predicated on a significant production cut. We didn't get it. And because we didn't get it, we are not going to see much in the way of further upside in oil prices, barring obviously a geopolitical shock out of the Middle East. Um, Aramco IPO might raise expectations about higher oil prices, but if the world economy is weak, why would OPEC push oil prices up and potentially choke off demand. They're not going to do that. They're not stupid. If you choke off demand in the global economy when it's starting to look a little bit soft, you're actually shooting yourself in the foot. Optimum level for oil prices is 55.65. I think if OPEC can keep oil prices within that range, they will be happy because if it goes, oil prices go much higher, it helps the shale producers. And last thing OPEC wants to do 
is help out the US shale producers because lower oil prices for US shale producers are not good for them. And there does appear to be some evidence that the shale boom is starting to peter out. So they're not they're not agreeing to cuts in output. It's it's co it's cosmetic, Karen. Then they're already overproducing. So um, you know, for me, it's about messaging more than anything else. At the end of the day, if you actually look at the numbers, OPEC has already cut production quite significantly from the levels a year ago. I am writing an article on that and I'll post it in the next couple of weeks on my outlook for oil prices. Um, I do an end of year summary um, on a whole host of um, on a whole host of uh, asset classes towards year end. So I'm doing one on sterling, I'm doing one on the euro, I'm doing one on oil companies and crude oil prices, I'm doing one on retailers and um, I will probably be doing one also on bond yields, the US dollar and what have you. So keep an eye out for them. Um, I will be sending them out and I will be posting them on the news and analysis section of the website. So for me, the optimum level for oil prices is 55.65. Not too low, um, not too high. If they can keep them within that corridor, I think they'll broadly be happy. Okay, so now let's, look, let's have a quick look ahead to next week um, because for me, what we've seen over the course of the past few days with respect to pound, the pound is financial markets pricing in the prospect of a Conservative Party majority. And that's why the pound has gone to the upside. Now, I'm very much a technically driven trader. So what we've seen over the course of the past few days with respect to sterling is very encouraging from my point of view. We've broken that area of resistance around about 130.20. And those of you who follow my daily commentary will know I was targeting 130.20 as a potential breakout level. Um, now, if we take the distance between this peak here and this low here, which is 127.70, 130.20, uh, 127.70 250 points. Projected up from 130.20 brings us to around about 133. So my minimum price objective for cable is 133 over the course of the next few days. Um, and for me, I think if that plays out as I suspect it will, then um, that would suggest to me that we are probably going to not get a Labour government or a Labour majority government more than anything else. Um, we should get a fairly positive outcome for the pound. Now, that's probably going to come back and bite me. But for me, this is all about levels. We've broken to the top side. The likelihood is as long as we stay above 130.20 here, this, 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 this support line here, and there's plenty, of, there's plenty of things that can go wrong. And this is something that I can't stress importantly enough. Markets are pricing in the prospect that Conservatives will be able to win enough seats to gain a majority. Now, of course... This assumes that all the new voters who signed up to vote for the very first time vote along the same lines as recent opinion polls suggest. Now, as we know from the 2017 experience, this is not the slam dunk some think it might be. Traditional party allegiances are breaking down. It's not going to take much for opinion pollsters to get egg all over their faces. And we could see a rapid repricing in the event that the polls narrow. Or obviously we have the exit poll just after 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the evening, Thursday night. And we should also be mindful of the Brexit referendum. Financial markets called that massively wrong. So it's not the slam dunk that people would say would suggest that it is, but certainly in terms of the price action here, it does look positive for further gains towards this li the, towards the April highs here. More importantly, Euro Sterling has also broken out towards the downside, which suggests that we could be in for a period of short-term sterling strength over the course of the next few days. And don't I think, so I'm just being asked a question here, don't I think these moves are about capitalising on what the polls are saying before any conclusive decision on hung parliament outcome on the 12th of 12th? Yeah, polls aren't definitive, of course they're not. 
but financial markets also tend to be um, forward-looking in nature and you know generally generally they tend to get it right so um, it's not often that they get it wrong obviously when they do get it wrong they get it wrong big style like they did in 2016 but I've always said this and I will continue to say this you can only trade what you see and what I see is cable breaking to the top side and based on that in the absence of any other news whatsoever if I didn't know what the political background was and I was just looking at that chart without the benefit of news without the benefit of any inputs from anyone or anywhere I would be looking to buy cable on any dips with a stop loss below 130 for a move to 133 just based on that price action alone not knowing anything else that's what you do when you're a technical trader one of the things about technical trading is that it affords you the luxury of ignoring the news or the noise as I like to call it because essentially you've got news coming at you from all angles particularly when currencies are concerned because not only do you have sterling related news you also have dollar related news and you've got that push pull effect on the exchange rate so trading currencies sometimes is an awful lot easier than changing um, the, the UK 100 the German DAX or anything else because you have two competing sets of fundamentals banging up against each other and for me I think the fact that number was so good for US payrolls and we only got a very minimal dip in cable suggests to me there's still an awful lot of stale sterling short positions out there that are still priced for a pessimistic outcome there's an awful lot of cautious shorts and you know if the Conservatives do win a majority then you could well see cable pop on that exit poll when it comes out on Thursday or if that poll lead widens if the poll lead narrows you could see sterling weakness kick in and we could head back towards 130 but as long as we hold above 130 then I'm of the opinion that we could well see a higher pound a year from now so certainly in terms of my one year target for cable is 138 now I could end up wearing that prediction but you've got to be in it to win it and I think it's likely to be nearer 138 than 125. My feel on the outcome of the election is based on the price action in cable. Um, and if currency markets are right, then the Tories should get a majority. Now, the big question is, how big will that majority be? Will it be 10 seats? Will it be 20? Will it be 30? You know, or will it be a minority government? We're not priced for a minority government. We're not priced for a hung parliament. We're priced for a Tory majority. And that's where the risk is at the moment, that they come up short or 20 seats or 30 seats or 40 seats or 50 seats. For me, what's the majority? At the moment, the, mar the markets are pricing in 45, 50. It's there or thereabouts. Anything over and above that could be construed as sterling positive. In the long term, it's not sterling positive, but in the short term it is because once we've moved past the withdrawal agreement you've then got the thorny issue of the transition period but certainly on the basis of what we are looking at over the course of the next few weeks you should see a pop in sterling towards 135 and I've just said what you've just said um, okay ladies and gents are there any other questions obviously we've got a European Central Bank meeting as well um, also on the same day, the, the 12th of December. And then this is important as well. So you need to bear this in mind. This will be Christine Lagarde's first meeting as ECB president. And while we're not expecting anything particularly um, earth-moving from the ECB, one thing does strike me. Mario Draghi was very adept, he was very adroit at fielding questions from journalists about monetary policy and, and the use of financial instruments to move the markets. Christine Lagarde doesn't have that background. She's a lawyer by trade. She used to be the French finance minister um, and her record there was questionable. Um, you could say the same about her record as chair of the IMF, the Greek bailout, Argentina and what have you. So my 
my take from next week's ECB meeting is how what sort of message she puts out there and who she has sitting next to her to deal with the p questions on monetary policy, of which she is not an expert. Is Chief Economist Philip Lane there um, to field any questions on monetary policy? So, um, big a big, big meeting, I think, for the ECB next week. Not expecting any changes, but certainly in terms of message delivery, I think it could be quite instructive. Um, Fed's next move... Um, Nothing before March. Nothing before March. Um, and th that's that's pretty much it. Also, we've got, um, if there is a Conservative majority, you should also see a um, nationalisation bounce in all of those stocks that are trading at a discount. Um, so companies like Royal Mail, um, BT, obviously the broadband thing, um, looking at the utilities like SSE, uh, United Utilities, Pennon, um, Centrica to a greater or lesser extent, um, the train providers like Go Ahead Group and uh, Stagecoach and National Express and uh, First Group. So you could also see a bit of a move higher in the FTSE 250 in the event that we get a positive outcome, a mu positive outcome for markets. So that's something else to bear in mind as well. OK, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this year for this non-farm payrolls webinar. I'd like to thank you all for um, tuning in every month to listen to me go on about the markets. It's been a pleasure. And um, if I don't speak to any of you before, I'd like to wish you all a great Christmas and a happy new year. And... Um, Stay out of trouble for the next two weeks when it comes to trading. You don't want to be going into Christmas with a dirty great big loss um, hanging over you. So, um, so yeah, thanks very much, ladies and gents. And um, I will speak to you all again, hopefully next year. Thanks very much. <laughs>